reversed. This video was filmed at the Abbey Medieval Festival and unfortunately the mic that we had used while filming picked up far too much of the background noise. But I genuinely love this conversation and much of the information that we got to talk about so I've tried to reduce some of the background noise as much as I could without compromising the clarity of how we're speaking. So I hope the noise isn't too distracting because I really do love this video and I hope that you'll enjoy it too. Greetings, I'm Shad, I'm here at the Abbey Medieval Festival and I came across a wonderful reenactor who has done a talk and display on medieval medicine which has been something of interest to me for a while but of course with so many subjects in the medieval period there's so much information when you get to the very specific subjects and this is one of those specific subjects I don't have a deep dive or deep knowledge on but I'm here with the medieval reenactor. She goes by Matthew because you reenact I reenact a male physician of the 12th, 13th century. Because um, when I first started doing this, I assumed like most people, it was only men that did it. But with more research, I've been able to find out there were actually women who did a lot of stuff as well in that 12th, 13th century. So I can do a woman persona, <laughs> but I usually do a male. So I'm dressed up as a male physician of the 12th, 13th century. See, I find that just, it, it falls in line with so many things that I've learned about the medieval period, that there are tropes, ideas that are, you know, repeated off and off and that people just take for granted and think apply broadly over the entire period, like no woman could be a physician. But people are people, and if there was a woman that wanted to learn this and was capable, depending on the region and area, there might have been social resistance to it, but other times, if someone needs something done, position. there we go. And I also believe, like, women would have filled the roles of midwife all the time. Yeah. That was a main, that, main yeah. woman role. Yeah. And you'll need to learn medicine and other practices in that role as well. Yeah, but certainly there were women who were noted as being surgeons mm -hmm. and general physicians, completely um, different to being midwives and that. Because, yeah, that's what I assumed was the only thing that was referring to that. One of the things that I commonly uh, kind of uh, run across in my you know breadth of interest in the medieval period is again the idea that people like to take little factoids and then exaggerate them too much and one of the ideas is that medieval people are illiterate uneducated and medieval medicine was just horrible across the board and if you like they were doing silly things and one of the things that I kind of find that they do that is that people like to hear this the oddities of history they latch onto it that gets repeated again and again and again to the point that that see, it, it paints a picture that they think it's only the oddities when there's actually a lot of practical intelligence and all that stuff and I've always suspected that was the case for medieval medicine as well. Definitely, there was a lot of rational thought put into trying to explain how the body worked, how to try and deal with illnesses, how to try to do something to get those things back into balance um, or temperatum as they called it at the time and so there was a lot of very rational thought they um now what were they called were they the four humors is that yep. the so the body was made up of four humors which were blood phlegm yellow bile and black bile and those four humors would either be hot or cold and and moist and dry so you had that combination of lots of things so those four humours were going back to Hippocrates and Galen were what made the body work in the way it was. If they were out of balance, that's what made you ill in either full body or a part of your body. Um, and they believed that humours needed to be in balance yep, to have good health. Yep. And so I've heard accounts of sometimes them assigning eating certain spiced things to try and bring up one of the humours. Yep, you might be told you need to eat food that's more warming. Um, not necessarily hot food, but food that is considered to have the properties of those humours to be more warming. Mm -hmm. Or you might be told as a woman you need to, you're probably a little bit too moist, that's why you're getting problems with your body. You might need to eat food that's sort of more drying. Um, so lots of different sort of things that you might actually eat or drink. Um, even exercise um, or massage and things like that. Massage that was light versus massage that was heavy. Um, whether or not you did a lot of exercise might influence those humours as well. What's interesting about the humour theory, we know it's incorrect, but there was a lot of rationale and theory Definitely. behind it and logic where they were trying to understand By how the By the 14th, 15th century, they start even um, making it into more complicated. So you had things that were drying in the first degree, but were hot in the fourth degree and <laughs> things like that. So it became even more complicated. And um, so, yeah, definitely. And by 14th century, you actually started getting things called um, the doctrine of signatures. So 
plant that we call lungwort. It's called lungwort because they felt that the leaves looked like lungs, therefore they must be good to treat the lungs. Ah, I see. So this is an example of some of the theory behind some of the incorrect notions they had with medical medicine, but they also had a lot of correct notions as well. Do you have any examples that you could share with us? Well, definitely a number of the plants that they would use um, for things like fevers and that, we now know actually do have stuff in them that help with fevers. So, uh, feverfew and meadowsweet and um, willow bark have got high amounts of what's called salicylic acid, and that is where we get acetyl salicylic acid, which is aspirin. So they worked well for pain and fevers, because they actually had compounds in them that worked really well. Um, the idea that uh, sometimes if you've got an injury, bathing it with vinegar actually would work really well for getting rid of um, bacteria and things like that. They didn't know that bacteria existed, um, not until we actually invented the microscope many centuries later did we know bacteria even existed, but they knew that rinsing things with vinegar, and so they worked out, according to the humours, why that would work. Uh, they also put vinegar in water occasionally as well, yep. because they knew putting it in water would keep Hydromel. it yep. fresh, a bit longer as well. Yep. Uh, sometimes yep. is, um, yep, you'd have honey with um, vinegar as well. Mm -hmm. Honey was used for wounds quite a lot. We now know why honey works so well, but uh, yeah, they used it quite a fair bit. Yeah. And one of the other areas of interesting sophistication is also surgery, uh, is one of the areas. Uh, what could you tell us about surgery? Surgery, uh, well definitely when it came to anatomy, things were quite different. Uh, <laughs> We didn't have the anatomical knowledge that we have now. It was something that went back quite a long way. So this was a sort of anatomy text that you'd have for the 12th, 13th century. Um, so as you can see, that's got the liver and the intestines. Yes. They felt that the uh, liver was the seat of digestion. Oh. <laughs> yep. Um, they felt that blood didn't circulate round. They felt it flowed in and out. We do know there was actually a um, Arab physician of the 13th century that felt that it did flow around, but we've only discovered his writings in the last 10 years, and obviously no one at the time listened to him because you've got to then go on to William Harvey to get blood circulating. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, they felt that blood ebbed and flowed in and out. One of the uh, methods that they had to try and deal with surgery, you, you, you previously did display on how they removed arrows. Yes, I have a number of different texts mm -hmm. that describe removal of an arrowhead, mm -hmm. so that's what I do my display on is the various things that are done to remove an arrowhead in this case from an abdomen so I need to check that there's no intestines that have been ruptured I need to open up the wound I need to talk about whether or not you can push it through depending on where it is because you need to know if you're going to cause more damage by doing that or do you need to bring it back out and then you want to minimise your damage to your patient and stuff like that. So same sort of principles today, you want to reduce damage, you want to reduce their chance of getting nasty infections and things like gangrene, because until antibiotics of the 1940s, we weren't able to treat gangrene. Mm -hmm. That's one of the areas where medieval medicine was very lacking, was dealing with infections yes. um, after many of the surgeries and things. That's where a lot of fatalities and deaths happen. Definitely. Gangrene was a major part, so a lot of times if you hurt your finger or cut your foot and you develop gangrene, the only way you might be able to save your life is amputation. And we know amputation definitely was done. We've got um, skeletons that are dug up. Head wound. Uh, so someone's been hit on the head, they've got a skull fracture. We know that uh, from writings at the time, one of the preferred ways to try and save their life was to actually drill a hole in their head, both to relieve the pressure of the subdural hematoma, yep. uh, which they didn't know about, but also too to raise those bits of broken skull possibly off. Um, and we know that people did survive those. We've actually got skeletal remains showing healed um, skull fractures and stuff like that. And see, that's remarkable because it goes to show you that they had a sophisticated enough understanding to perform some quite complex surgeries. Mm. Surviving after the fact could be a bit depending on, on, on infection. There's a famous one from a gentleman that was dug up after the battle, like he was buried after the battle of Towson. They've been, he's been dug up in the last 20 years. They found that he'd previously, at least five years before the battle of Towson, which he didn't survive, he'd been hit on the side of the face with probably a sword. So he had a fractured mandible, so here, um, had actually fractured here as well, what they call the mandibular synthesis, and a fractured cheekbone. 
and now that would certainly be something that we'd make sure that they didn't you wouldn't want to get infection and this gentleman had actually healed up so well he'd gone back to being a sergeant of arms and then died with a, <laughs> a uh, pickaxe through his head he, used, he got all his luck surviving the first time but that's a devastating wound that you know with examples of many people surviving that through mm. treatment it is actually remarkable and so the idea that if you you're always going to die of infection isn't a case infection was an issue of course and going to your medieval surgeon was not a oh no you're going to die mm. there was no such thing as elective surgery but you certainly went to your medieval doctor if you needed to and we'd do what we could for you yeah. including I, check your urine oh exactly <laughs> that's one of the ways they measured the humors isn't it yep. yeah i uh, became very popular as a common way to look at the humors to the point that uh you even had nice complicated uh charts um and a lot of medieval manuscript pictures best way to tell who the doctor is is the one with the, <laughs> the urine flask so you'd look at the color uh anything in there any foam the smell, last but not least. Yep, I was... <laughs> the taste. Yeah, and if it was a, had a sweet tinge, that would give them an indication of... Where... Diabetes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Too much glucose in the urine, they've got diabetes, and this year is 100 years since we've actually had insulin to be able to treat diabetes. Yeah. And what's interesting, obviously, to the modern day, people would be revolted and think it's gross, but even in the modern day, we actually need a test urine to get a lot of indications of I do much prefer with urine now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. a little I dipstick, a bit, yeah. <laughs> much prefer that one. This is not but, real urine, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but without that technology, how are you going to test, test it? And so they were obviously willing to do things that we might find revolting out of necessity because there was actual precedent logic behind it. And this is just one clear example. And so some of the takeaways uh, for this video is that more complexities in surgery, the actual knowledge of herbology was far more sophisticated and complex than people might realize. We've got gentlemen being operated on for various wounds here. Um, oh, uh, arrowhead, spongiosum somnifera, a type of uh, sleeping sponge with various herbs in it that mm -hmm. is supposed to make you sleepy. And then, um, oh yeah, here we go. Cataract surgery, nasal polyps, some of the uh, instruments that were used at the time. Very stylized, unfortunately, when it comes to medieval manuscripts. I don't think your patient would actually sit there to get a nasal polyp cut out with a cup holding a cup for you. And uh, certainly for cataract surgery, I don't know many people that would stand there for you without moving. Um, there is actually a really great uh, fresco from Roman times that actually show a patient having cataract surgery and they've actually got the wrist bound, which is written in Roman cataract surgery text yeah. saying you need to actually bind their wrists and have someone strong holding them. Did they have it, um, any uh, use, what did they use for antiseptics? Was alcohol a common one? Or? Alcohol, vinegar was very commonly used, um, a number of different um, plant um, sort of washes and stuff like that but vinegar is probably the most common one actually that you read in a lot of the text which is interesting. And something else that I think is worth pointing out as well, the wine. But then oh. wine becomes vinegar quite often yes. too, if it's left long enough. Yeah. The, the quality of medicine would very much determine on the skill of the physician. Hmm. And uh, uh, just, you can draw parallels because people are people. And even in the modern day, there are people good at their job and people who are bad at their job, but still practice the job. And so I do get, get the impression that a lot of the good physicians would get a reputation and also they would learn through trial and error if they're paying attention. It's like, well, this one didn't really work. Maybe I'll avoid that practice in the future. There were certainly a number of texts written, but because uh, everything was handwritten, um, you, didn't, you probably wouldn't have many texts. You'd uh, potentially, in terms of education, you could be just learned by apprenticing to someone or you could attend a university. Uh, the character I portray is actually university trained. And that's another thing, not many people know that there were universities in the yeah. medieval period. I read about a famous one in the city, uh, at the Italian city of Bologna, which was famous for its university. People would travel to go there to learn. Uh, the 12th, 13th century, the three most popular ones for medicine were uh, the University of Paris, uh, Montpellier in the south of France, 
but then the university at Salerno was considered the ultimate peak. There was a lot of people that were actually translating stuff from the Greek and Latin, um, so the Greek and Arabic, and back into Latin in Salerno. And so Salerno was the place to be if you were going to be learning medicine. Um, Alexandria was also really popular as well, oh, yes. but not necessarily for everyone. Um, my character I portray, he's from um, southern France. He actually then travelled to Salerno and studied there, has spent a little bit of time at Alexandria and is currently based in Arca. So actually I do that uh, crusade area. So oh, that's thing. wonderful. But I think those are the main main things that uh, we cover. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, You're welcome. Michael. Um, Matthew. Matthew, sorry. Matthew. That's fine. It started with an M. And also thank you very much for watching. I uh, hope to see you on the next time here on Shadowversity. So until then, Thank you to everyone who's come to watch this video. It really means the world, but unfortunately there are a lot of people who are not getting notified of my content. YouTube is currently deranking and suppressing content like mine to, in preference to other content, and a lot of my viewers and subscribers are not actually getting notified. One of the ways in which is actually a truly a tremendous help in trying to break through this type of suppression is by subscribing. If you enjoy the content, please do subscribe and join us in the future. Liking and commenting helps boost the interactions on the video which makes the algorithm realize that more people are engaged. And of course, sharing is absolutely really crucial to help everyone know that, yes, this video exists, and letting the people know who want to watch this content that it's actually made and it's released. Ringing the bell only does so much to try and get notifications. YouTube has actually not been notifying people who have even the bell rung, and so if you really want to ensure that you get notified when I upload, you can follow me on Facebook or Twitter. I announce when I upload on those platforms, and the ultimate way to make sure you never miss a, an upload and get the notification is by subscribing on my website. We'll send out emails notifications to those people who are signed up on the website. There will also be special announcement and even potential bonus content for those people who subscribe on the website. For everyone who's doing that, thank you so much. It means the world and especially those people who are going even the extra step and supporting me through the donation platforms. Currently the primary ones have been Subscribestar and Patreon but there's a new one that is brilliant called Utrion. Utrion is a video hosting platform that also does donation style subscriptions like the memberships on YouTube currently but it's also a great video hosting platform and truly if every one of my active viewers were able to donate between one to five dollars a month that would give me complete security and less reliant on the ad revenue system which gives me options to pursue and try and support many alternative platforms because unfortunately YouTube is caring less and less about content creators who are making content like me I'm not the only one in this boat so please do support the creators that you want to ensure that they can keep making content and that you get the content that you want to see Genuinely thank you to everyone who's supporting in any way possible. It means the world. And thank you very much for having watched this video. Hope to see you on the next one.